Can you hear me? I can. Good, I can hear you too. Is that Beverly? Yes, it is. Sherry, you can hear me? Yeah, wow. hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Small miracles. Why, Maria? Can you speak up? Can, Sherry, can you see my presentation? Nope. Mm, she doesn't think anybody else can either. I, I saw it a second ago, and then it went back to the front page, uh, the Healthy Homes webinar, Children's Trust thing. Oh, here it is. I see it now. It says that I'm no longer the presenter. Okay, I just realized I've been muted. I'm really Here's sorry. Like okay. Where does it say that, Bev? I, I have a message that, oh, it says now I've been made the presenter. Okay, good. Okay, okay so, so yeah, if there's a button that says show your screen, yeah, there you go. We are in sure. business. Thanks so much. Right. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Do we think we're in business? I think we are in business. If anybody um, is having an issue, please put uh, type something in the questions box. Otherwise, I'll get going. Okay, well, I think I'll just get going. So. Um, Thank you all for being patient and for being here today. We were supposed to have this presentation last Friday, but the state computer system went down for six business, six calendar days, so we're here today. And I'm with my good friend Sherry Bamarito um, from Child and Family Services. Sherry, can you Hello. hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Great. So my name is Beverly Druin, and I work at the Division of Public Health. Um, I partner with Maternal and Child Health on Healthy Homes activities at the state. And Sherry and I have been working on Healthy Homes staff probably five years now, I think. I think um, you're right. 
And we're here today to talk about this one-touch home visiting model. So, um, so the one-touch home visiting model, what is the needs? Well, we know that the families that you visit, and I oversee the childhood lead poisoning at the state, so I know the families that we visit, that these people have a lot of needs. Um, they have energy needs, health needs, family needs, housing needs, and there's a very limited amount of finances and resources here in the state to help these people. So the one touch is a really a new home visiting model to how, really to try to figure out how to provide these families more with less. Um, we know that for all of our home visiting programs, the hardest thing to do is to get our foot in the door. So once we have our foot in the door, we want to be able to provide these families as much as we can. So what's the benefit to this one-touch thing? Well, you folks know how to do referrals. You're probably experts in the referrals that you make now. But what we're going to try to do is to teach you some referrals that maybe you didn't know before, some housing, energy, health referrals. So it's to teach a more effective referral system. It provides added health services to these families, reduces energy use, and it We've heard feedback from Sherry and her workers and from other MCH agencies that it just pr it provides better tools in their toolboxes. They feel like they're able to help these families better. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and on, on that note, too, um, most of the home visiting programs, and I know that most of the people who are on this line are from Healthy Families America. And you guys know that you are required to do the one-touch form, and you're also required to do the ASQs, the Watch Me Grow um, screenings. And without, you may not realize this, but those are really connected because if there's a family you're working with that's li living in um, a lead-based uh, home, then that could be an indication as to why maybe this child is developmentally delayed. So it's really, really important that we connect both of those things and that you continue to do what you're doing. Fantastic. So like I said, Sherry and I had been doing this one-touch home visiting model since uh, 2009. So uh, this list here are other states uh, across the nation who are using it. I should have put New Hampshire at the top because Sherry, you were part of the original pilot. But yeah. when I went out to the national convention a couple, four weeks ago, we met with these other states and other agencies who were using it. And they were curious that we had been successful in using it so long. So it was, it was fun to meet other one-touch people. So one-touch, basically what it's trying to do, it's trying to weave three different types of home visiting agencies, home visiting people together. So if you look at these three uh, purple boxes, my program is primarily in the first box. I work in the Division of Public Health. We help people with childhood lead, childhood asthma, visiting nurses, smoking, that type of thing. Um, we have a lot of friends who are in the second box. They work with people with housing. We have friends down at New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority in the weatherization program. Habitat for Humanity, Rebuilding Together, these people primarily just work with housing. And then we have all the other partners who work with energy. So we have several um, home energy programs here in the state. We have the low income one, a middle income one. Uh, we have a, the, the community action program does weatherization. So uh, typical one touch partners fall into one of these three buckets. You're either working with family and their health, family and housing, family and energy. Why we partner with the MCH folks is because you have the perfect opportunity to get in the door to these families. MCH is visiting more families here in New Hampshire than any other home visiting agency, maybe short of the Visiting Nurse Association. So that what, that's what makes you folks a perfect partner. Mm -hmm. oh. I thought I was covering my photo here. I'm trying to take all the little photos out. But that's me down in the bottom right corner. Um, so one touch home visiting is basically, it's three things. We're going to teach you how to assess these families' home using this one touch checkup form. So you're already really good at assessing the family's needs, but we're going to try to teach you how to assess the home. Sometimes you 
people refer to it as the built environment, but it's the structure, whether it's a condo, whether it's an apartment, whether it's a penthouse or a basement apartment or a home. It's assessing the built environment. And then we're going to teach you how to educate these families using our One Touch Healthy Home brochure. And then we want to try to help teach you to add referrals to the ones you're already making, to refer these people to some housing and energy and health partnerships. So, yeah. Assessing, educating, and referring. So, can I sit on the partners in the state fall in one of those three purple boxes? These are primarily our partners. So, um, it's background. I'll just spell it out here. The first one's uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development. They do lead hazard and uh, healthy homes. OEP is Office of Energy and Planning. They take care of all the weatherization dollars here in the state. You folks know what MCH is. CDC, that's Center for Disease Control. That's who I'm funded by. Uh, USDA, US, uh, United States Division of Agriculture. They take care of um, health and safety home repairs, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and DES, Department of Environmental Services. So it's just a sea of acronyms, but these are all the funding partners that we work with and have worked with since 2009. And they cover lead and weatherization and asthma and injury and drinking water and tobacco, you name it. Um, so we have been training MCH home visitors since the pilot, Sherry, you did in 2009, but mm -hmm. we've also trained um, community action program energy auditors, the nurse case managers in the lead program, the asthma educators, we've trained some of them. Um, we've done a little training on Head Start, uh, trained two of the special medical services home visitors, and we want to train the VNA. So, so the asterisks at the bottom are agencies that we want to expand to, and the rest of them are all home visiting agencies that we have been working with, including yourselves. So Sherry and I are going to try to walk you through this one-touch checkup form. And I know that we sent it out to you um, the end of last week. So if you have it in front of you, great. If you don't, we're going to um, show it to you here on the screen. So basically, it's a seven-section um, questionnaire, and we call it the one-touch checkup form. So it currently has about 29 questions. So there's a committee statewide that's working. I think, Sherry, you're on that committee. That's yes, I am. We assess this checklist to, to scale it back a little bit. So we've been using it since 2009 and have got really good feedback from the city of Manchester and from Child and Family Services that some of the questions might not be as important as we thought, and that we might want to add some questions that we missed when we put this thing back together in 09. It's designed to take about 20 minutes in the home. So I think as we go through it, you're going to see that there's questions that you already ask these people. And they're, you'll, you'll already know them. They're questions you've asked from other lines, other parts of your business. Um, so there is seven sections, program, client information, demographics, energy efficiency, occupant health, environmental conditions, and injury prevention. Um, so we're going to start at the very front end of it, the, the general program information. And the, very, the top of this program information is your program. So Sherry, if, if this was one of your home visitors, the administrating pro, administering program would be Child and Family Services, Mm -hmm. And was it Manchester or Concord or? Yep, yep. And um, the home visitor would put um, her name, um, the client referral number, that would be the case number. And then you would include the client information, which most of you do um, from intake anyways. And I just wanted to um, mention that I know sometimes it's difficult, but if we could make sure that we fill these forms out completely, it makes it a lot easier when we have to input this information. Um, and best time to call is important, especially if we're making a referral to one of our partners who, who needs to make a call to get in there to maybe do some help with um, weatherization or, or something like that. Um, so as best as you can, just fill this out as completely as you can. 
Now, Sherry, is the landlord name and phone number, is that, cur is that information that you would typically be collecting? Well, sometimes, and that's when it gets a little bit difficult because some of our, home, um, our clients, and I'm sure the home visitors can attest to this, um, sometimes our clients know the landlord's name is Charlie, and that's it. Um, but I'm hoping that most of our clients, if there was an issue in the apartment, that they would have a way of reaching the landlord, and um, if they could pass that information on to the home visitors, that could be put into this section. Yeah. Now, we've had feedback over the years that some of the families that we visit are a little nervous about giving the landlord name. We're going to mm -hmm. go over um, the form completely, but you will see that nobody ever can call the landlord without the tenant's permission. Mm -hmm. And so some of the funding sources that we're going to try to hook these families up, it's funding for the landlord, some of it. So that's why the landlord's name is so important. So we're just highlighting the box, the program information, the program you belong to, and then the client information is um, for the family that you're visiting. Landlord's name, phone number. So the, sex, the, sex, the, the third section on here, I call it a demographic section, and basically it's a family inventory. So um, the questions 1, 2, 5, and 6, so are any residents over 60, are any residents disabled, do the residents own the home, and do they receive financial assistance? Those are information, that's information that we're collecting to find out if these families are eligible for our state's weatherization dollars. So the dollars that come from the energy, Office of Energy and Planning at the state that help these families energize, uh, weatherize their home. So we've all been to homes, or I've been to homes, where the mother is heating the home with the oven door wide open, and the wind is blowing through those windows. So we're just trying to make it a little bit warmer environment. So, so questions 1, 2, 5, and 6 are for weatherization. On question 6, do, they, do any residents receive federal assistance? You can see here these are yes and no questions, and then you could just circle what type of um, assistance that they're receiving. Now, question number three, are children under six years old? This is for the childhood lead poisoning, the lead poisoning program at the state. In the state of New Hampshire, we're supposed to be testing all our children under six years old for lead poisoning. And so there's a series of questions later on in this form to find out if these children have been tested for potential lead poisoning. So that's why this question 3A is on here, and it's a yes or no. And so you can see here on question six, you're just going to check it and then circle what type of fuel, what type of uh, federal assistance this family might be receiving. So question um, number seven on here, there is no eight, it's just question seven, does everyone have a health care provider? So here in the state of New Hampshire right now, we want every family to be able to hook up with um, an insurance carrier and a health care provider. And Sherry, you mentioned that you're folks are adept at this type of questioning and know what to do when people don't have a provider. Yes, um, because we want to make sure that all of our clients have um, primary care providers, all of our babies have pediatricians, so we're, we're pretty, pretty on top of that. That's good then. So the, the, this is the first section that's really assessing the house or the built environment that we called it. So there's three questions here, 9, 10, and 11, that are for weatherization. So the weatherization program that we have here in the state, we have two types. We have a low-income weatherization program that, um, that we have been referring families to, and then we have a middle-income weatherization program that I'm actually applying for because I have an old house. But this, these questions here are primarily for low-income families. So there's a... There's a fairly long list for weatherization here in the state, but there's uh, these six blue bullets here. These are the things that would get, get your family to the front of the waiting list. So if there was someone in the home who was older than 60, if there was someone in the home under 19 years old, if somebody was disabled, if they were a high energy user, what that means is once we look at their oil bills, their gas bills, their electric bills, they're paying way too much for the space that they're living in. Is there a, par a potential carbon monoxide leak? Oh, and I have high energy user twice. So there's really six um, high priority things here. So 
So in my house, I'm a high energy user. For the little tiny house that I have, our furnace runs a lot because it's so drafty. Oh, let me go back. So um, the most important thing, I guess, as the takeaway that you need from this slide is the second bullet. So for okay. families to qualify for fuel assistance, they need to qualify, sorry, for family to qualify for weatherization, they need to qualify for fuel assistance. So fuel mm -hmm. assistance is the front door to weatherization. And so many of our clients will qualify for fuel assistance. We just need to make sure that we refer them for fuel assistance, um, usually beginning in September, October. And most of our clients, um, in the fact that they have children under the age of 19 in the home, would be able to apply. Okay, so if you look at the um, cutout here of the form, and you can see under the yes, no question mark, see how it's shaded? So the question number nine, what fuel is used for heating? That's not a yes, no question. So shading means you do not write in that part of the form. So what fuel is used for heating? You go to the far right, you check off oil, natural gas, propane, and it might be more than one. Um, question number 10, was the occupant cold last winter in this home? So that's a yes or a no, or an I don't know means that they didn't live in this home last year. So, it, so if the part of the form is shaded off, it means you're not writing in that part of the form. So section can, can, can we go? Can we just go back to that slide one more time, Dove? So a number eleven too. A lot of times, I, I remember when I was a home visitor, and I'm sure you guys experienced this as well is um, especially in the wintertime if you're making a home visit and you notice that they have blankets um, tacked on to doorways and, and you know they try to close off particular rooms, that, that is a good indication on how to answer number 11. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we, anybody who has a large home blocks off room or if you have an apartment and you only have the heating source in the living room, the bedrooms might be, you know, they they're cold and they're probably isolated off during the daytime just to keep the heat in the main part of the house. So um, this next section here, question 15, question 15 A, B, C, D is really just about asthma. So the question number 15 A is anyone living in this house been diagnosed with asthma? It's a yes or no. And if they have, how old is this person? It might be the child. It might be the dad. It could be the grandpa for all we know. If, the, if, if they have been diagnosed with asthma, is this person currently using a rescue medicine for asthma? Again, yes or no. If they are using their rescue medicine, see over on the right-hand side, how many times a week are they using the rescue medicine? So there's some rules of thumb. If they're using it more than three times a week, something's not right. So rescue medicine is just what it says. It's not designed to be used every day. It's only in an emergency. So if you're using it every day, your regular maintenance medicine is not right. And number C, if yes, did this person have any unplanned doctor visits for asthma in the last six months? So it's really, did they have unplanned doctor visits? Did they have hospitalization? Did they go to the ER or the urgent care? Did they miss work? Did they miss school? So you're trying to get a sense of how irregular their life is. And on the right, there's some examples of res rescue medicine. So the point of this section is here, you can have families who have asthma. 10% of the adults and the children in New Hampshire have asthma right now. What we're trying to tease out are the families that you work with whose asthma is not well controlled. We want to help them have a better life, OK? So 15D is just the name of the, um, the provider and the practice. So who do they go to? What's the name of the practice? So question number 16, let me go to the next slide and see if it's there. OK. So question number 16 is about COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And I think of it as grown-up asthma. So children have asthma, adults have asthma, older adults, very often it goes to COPD. So typically, you won't find this with your children, but you might find it with mom and dad or grand and grandpa in the house. So the question is, are there occupants with other respiratory problems? Yes or no, and what are they? We want to try to get these people as much help as we can also. 
Question number 17 is about carbon monoxide. And I think, Sherry, in our new form, they're going to rearrange this and put this in the carbon monoxide section. But for right now, it's in the um, breathing section. Mm -hmm. So carbon monoxide, for those of you who don't remember, it is from heating sources in your home. It's invisible. You can't taste it. You don't know what's happening. You feel sleepy. You might feel like you have the flu. You want to lay down. And what happens is you don't get up. So what we're trying to find out are do people feel like they have flu-like symptoms or headaches when they're in the home, but then when they leave, they feel good. They come back, they get headaches. When they leave, they feel good again. So it might be a, pre a precursor to um, carbon monoxide poisoning. So that's a simple yes or no. Um, Sherry, you told me that you, you're, you already asked these families about smoking, didn't you? Yes, because that's something that we have to, we're required to get outcomes for smoking um, as part of our contract with the state. So we have to actually refer clients to New Hampshire Footworks if they are actually smoking in the home. So I, I think I asked you this before, but I don't remember. So do you, when you ask someone about smoking, do you record what they answer or do you record what you see? So I ask, I ask you, do you smoke, and you go, no, no, no. But then I go in the bathroom, and there's cigarette butts in the toilet. Well, I think we have to, we report what they tell us, but then, I mean, if we, I know if I was the home visitor um, and I saw the cigarette butts, I would ask them right out. They may say it's the boyfriend's or whatever. Um, but, you know, in my own notes, I would yeah. put that, you know, I suspected that you know, she was smoking. But, uh, you know, we have to go by what they tell us. Yeah. For this one-touch checklist, we want you to record what you see. Mm -hmm. So just what you see, that's all. You know, you're not tattling on anybody, just what you see. And so, if they're smoking inside the house, it may not just be the mom. If they live in a multi-generational home and grandma smokes, that is somebody smoking in the home. So you would have to answer yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Section 5 is the environmental section of this form, and it covers lead, fire, carbon monoxide safety, moisture mold, pests, radon, indoor air quality, and drinking water. So we're going to start with lead. So to refresh your memory, lead was outlawed in homes in 1978, so we're trying to find out what families live in pre-1978 homes. Um, is the home in good condition, or can we get them to some funding that can help them and have these children be tested? So question number 19A, was the home built before 1978? Yes, no, I don't know. So I think for the most part, people can tell a home when it's 100 years old, and people can tell a new home, a condo, but sometimes the 50s, 60s, 70s, people don't really know that architectural style. So that's what the I don't know is. If it was built before 78, do you see flaking, peeling, or chipping paint? I think that's pretty easy. That's a yes or no. And if it was built before 78, have any of the children under six years old living in the home or those who regularly visit the home, have they been tested for lead? So in the state of New Hampshire, we want to test all our children um, under six years old for lead. And we have about 1,000 children every year that have uh, more than five micrograms per deciliter of lead in their blood, which is a, lead, you know, it's a poisoning in the eyes of CDC. So we're really fortunate that currently we have about $8 million in HUD money, Housing, Urban, and Development money, in the state to remove lead hazards. So there's a pocket of funding in Nashua, a pocket of funding in Manchester, and then New Hampshire Housing Finance has money for the whole remainder of the state. So I think that we remove lead hazards in somewhere around 300 houses a year, buildings. So buildings a year. So if you live in a four-unit building, I mean, that's four units. So it's good. It's good money. And they do good things. Question number 20 is about pests. So I'm sure everybody knows what kind of pests there are. In New Hampshire, primarily, we have mice, squirrels, cockroaches, ants, rats bed bugs and fleas. People ask me about silverfish. Um, so is there evidence of pests, yes or no? And then simply circle what type of pests you have. So in my house, I have mice and I have little tiny sugar ants. 
Um, but I bet you guys see a lot more than that. Mostly bed bugs. <laughs> bed bugs is circled. So um, the reason why we're asking about pests is well, there's a couple reasons. So mice dander, that's their fur. Mice dander and cockroach frass, cockroach poop is frass, those are asthma triggers. Um, and then the chemicals that we all use in our homes to get rid of these um, pests, those, that's a huge asthma trigger. And, it, and if you have pests, other than bed bugs, actually other than bed bugs and fleas on this list, every single pest on this list has to have moisture. So they're not going to be in your home if you don't have moisture. So think of my home. I have mice in my home because I leave the dog's water dish out all night long and the mice drink from it. If there was no moisture, they would leave my, my house and go find somewhere else to live. Squirrels, cockroaches, ants, they all need moisture and a source of food. Bed bugs, the food is the human, and fleas, um, the food is the skin. So question number 21, are there smoke alarms? So Sherry, do you folks already ask about smoke alarms? Um, I know that we do in our Home Visiting New Hampshire program because it's part of our intake form. And we actually have to view where they are located and write that in on the form. So we can't just take a yes or no answer. We have to actually see them. Perfect. So this question is a yes or no. You can see the I don't know parts grayed out. So are there smoke alarms, yes or no? And right underneath it says need one per unit per level in the common areas. Need one per unit per level in the common areas, each level of the common area. And this is required by law in the state of New Hampshire in rental units. So we want to know if these smoking, smoke alarms are working. Sometimes that's tough if they're up on 10-foot, um, 12-foot ceilings. I mean, it's, I don't think, Sherry, that your little 5-foot, 2-inch frame is going to get up on a chair with a broomstick. <laughs> Check and see if it's working. But if you can, that's what we want to do. Because um, well, two-thirds of fire deaths here in the state of New Hampshire take place in um, um, homes where the smoke detector is not working. I also think that a lot of our clients take the batteries out because, um, and, and then they're not plugged in type of sure. thing. So I think when we make a home visit and we notice that, we really need to say something to the clients and explain why it's important that they're working. Exactly. And we want to see, question 21C, we want to see if these families have an emergency evacuation plan. Our friend Mary McCaffrey, who works at the Division of Fire Safety, has a fantastic handouts for home visitors to work with families on a means of egress, a second way to get out of the home. So, question number 22 for carbon monoxide is really not that different than smoke alarms. We want to make sure that they have one in every unit, on every level, outside the sleeping areas, and that's required by law in rental units. We want to make sure that, these, that they're working. Again, are they unplugged? Are there batteries? Um, 22C is a little bit harder. We're trying to find out if there's unvented combustion sources. Are there gas stoves or dryers or space heaters or generators? So I try to teach people, I think a good rule of thumb is anything in your home that makes heat that's not plugged in, that's not electric, can potentially make carbon monoxide. So I think of my house. I have an electric stove, so it will not make carbon monoxide. But I have a gas furnace, and I have a, a gas clothes dryer. And my water heater is um, has a pilot light on the bottom. So all of those things potentially make carbon monoxide, and they're not vented to the outside. They're vented right into the home. So you want to think about unvented combustion sources. They all need to be vented to the outside. And 22D, again, do occupants have flu-like symptoms or headaches experienced only when they're in the home? And I, I just want to remind everybody, because I think for some of you, it, this might be new information, that it is a law that um, carbon monoxide alarms are installed in rental units. Um, and I bet you, you guys would notice that there are a lot of units that don't have them. So um, when you come across that, this is when you, you would need to, um, is this when they would call the fire department, Bev? 
It is. So in the, my understanding, in the state of New Hampshire, we have the statute that says there has to be carbon monoxide, but they haven't made the rules yet for enforcing it. Okay. So it depends on what city you're in. So if you're in the city of Manchester, Nashville, Portsmouth, some of the bigger cities, they know how to handle it. If you're in a little tiny community, like my, you know, I'm in Bosquin, little, little tiny community, um, they might not have the means to enforce this as of yet. But yes, you'd want to call your local fire department. So moisture, what house doesn't have moisture, right? So moisture comes from water leaks, uh, landscape that's graded so all the water drains into the home, insufficient insulation. That's my home. I have this older home that's not insulated very well. So when I, um, I would say when I boil spaghetti, the condensation gets on the windows. So that the temperature difference between the inside of my home and the outside of my home is so different. That's why you have condensation. Um, like I said before, pests, it brings pests into the home, and moisture is an asthma trigger. So question 23, is there evidence of moisture? So you want to look around for um, visible mold. Are there musty smells? Do you see condensation? Is there rotting wood by the slider or by the windows? Do you see an unvented dryer? If you look at the ceiling, are there water stains or leaks? Did the bathroom upstairs leak at some point? So you just want to look around. So that's a yes and no, and then check what you see. Question number 25 is, is oh, hold on. It looks like the, the OK. Question 25, um, I'm going to, I'm not looking. It looks like the slide does not, the, the cutout on the slide does not match the text of the slide. So let's look at the cutout, 25A. Have you tested your home for radon? So radon is naturally occurring from the granite that our homes are built on. Remember, we're the granite state. It's, again, it's invisible. It's a uh, radioactive source. And over a long period of time, what it does, it causes lung cancer. It's the leading cause of environmental, it's the leading environmental cause of cancer in the United States if you can believe that one. And in New Hampshire, we have 200 deaths every year of lung cancer that's radon-induced. So these are the people who die of lung cancer. You're like, I don't get it. They never smoked. How can this be? And it's because their homes had radon leaking into them. So we want to see if our families have tested their homes for radon. And 25B, we want to see if these people have tested their, the people who are in private wells, we want to see if they test their drinking water for uh, contaminants. So if you have a family who's in a city, Nashua, Manchester, Laconia, Portsmouth, they're drinking city water, and the city tests it. But if you're in a small town like I am, Bosquin or Bow or Chichester or Colebrook or something, most of these people are on private wells, and they need to test their wells with some type of frequency, not just for bacteria, but we have naturally occurring arsenic here in the state, again, from this granite that we live on. And, and arsenic, if you are drinking water with arsenic in it over a long time, it will lead to bladder cancer, so another environmental cancer. So we're coming into the tail end of the questions. We're down to the injury prevention section. So questions 20. Six and 27 are for older adults. So older adults is not firmly defined. Um, it's you know not magically when you turn 60 or 65. So you have to judge that yourself. But for older adults, are grab bars present in the bathroom by the toilet and the tub? And for older adults, are handrails present along the staircase? So here, this is a yes or a no. Or the third column is there, you know, is there, I don't know, because there are no older adults living in the home. Maybe it's just a young family. Maybe the parents are 26 and it's just children. So if there's no older adults in the family, it's of no concern. But questions 28 and 29, these are for everybody. So question 28 is really for everybody in the house, whether they're 2 years old or 80 years old. And it's about lighting. We want to have lighting in five different places in our home. So think of your own home. You want lighting at the top and the bottom of the staircase. You want it in the bathroom, 
the bedroom and outside the entryway. So the question is, is lighting sufficient at these five places? So yes or no, it has to be in all of them to get a yes. Question 29A through D is for small children. And I would guess, Sherry, that you folks are pretty good at ask, asking this kind of information and having a good eye for this. Yeah, and I just want to remind people, I don't know if you've heard the news uh, in the last week or so, um, but there were actually two occurrences with um, babies falling out of windows. So no, I have um, not heard that. Yep, yep. This is the time of year for that, so this is very important. Bad. Okay, so 29A, are there child gates if the stair, stairs are present? Yes, no, the third column is there's no stairs. Are there window blind cord safety devices? I guess I know there's fancy devices they sell, but what we're really just trying to determine, are the win window cords tied up and away from children? Mm -hmm. Are there window guards or stops on windows that are higher than the first floor? And are all medicines and poisons out of reach? Every year we hear of some horrible thing that happens with babies. It breaks your heart. And especially in our partnership where we have, so, we have you folks at MCH, you know, receive MCH funding, they, this is your expertise. I mean, you know what you're looking for. So the very back of the forms um, is now you've asked these 29 questions. Now what do you do with your answers? So you, the back page here, understanding the information gathered, referrals and client education, is really to help you understand what to do. Now you've got these answers, what does it mean? So you, you answer, you ask questions about asthma, and then you go to this back page, and you see what the answers mean. And so for each um, asthma, carbon monoxide, lead, it walks you down through each one. And now we're not going to go through each one of these here, but let's just talk about asthma for a minute. So question 15A is, did someone in the house have asthma? Yes. And question 15B is, are they using their rescue medicine too frequently? Yes. So if they have asthma and they're using their rescue medicine too frequently, we want to refer them to back to their primary care physician or to the New Hampshire Asthma Control Program where those folks can get them the help that they need. Let's take a look at another one. So here's the lead program. So if you answer yes to question number three, and that was do you have a child under six in the home, and 19A, um, refer tenant to this, this um, training must have been done for the National Health Department, but it would be the ones that you have in front of you, it says the State of New Hampshire Healthy Homes and Lead Poisoning Prevention Program for educational material and information how to get these children tested. And if they have chipping, fleeking, peeling paint, we want to get them to that lead hazard control grant, get the landlord to that program, so we can get some funding to remove those lead hazards from those children. Now, not every single one of these things, these questions here, are we going to be able to refer these families to agencies that have funding to help them. Unfortunately, sometimes we're just going to be able to provide them education. There's currently not any funding in the state of New Hampshire for moisture or mold. Um, we do know that, um, that it, for your clients who are living in rental equipment, hold on, that's my telephone ringing. I have to shut this off. <laughs> I am so sorry. I am so sorry. That's a faux pas. <laughs> Anyways. Um, if you have families who live in their own homes, there's not much you can do about moisture or mold, but if you have families who rent um, RSA 48A, which is the minimum standards for uh, housing additions here in New Hampshire, has some, something in the statute about moisture and mold. It's really about plumbing leaks and that type of thing. So what we're really trying to do is just get these families the help that they need. So, so let me back up. So for every question that you ask on the checkup form, this referral and client education section goes through and tells you what to do with those agents, with those answers, and what agencies can help you. And then if this page here, page four, the referral and client education, 
these are the names, the phone numbers, and the fax numbers of all the agencies that can help you. So we have um, a statewide one-touch checkup form, but if you do business in the city of Manchester, they've customized their own in Manchester with their Manchester phone numbers. If you do home visiting in Nashua or Greater Nashua, their Healthy Home Partnership has customized theirs. If you do home visiting in the North Country, uh, uh, they've customized theirs. So different regions of the state have customized theirs. Um, there are more communities that use the statewide one where it's not customized than the few communities that have customized theirs. So Sherry, I know you folks do work throughout the state, so you have mm -hmm. people using the national one, the Manchester yep. one, and the North Country one. Right. So let's take a look at what some of these um, pop-up boxes would look like. So I just expanded it here so you could look at it. So if you have families who have, someone in the family has uncontrolled asthma, we, we've given you a phone number and a website here so you can reach the New Hampshire Asthma Control Program and get them some better educational resources. If you, the second one, carbon monoxide, we want you to call your local fire department first or you can, call, you can call the Office of the State Fire Marshal or go on their website. So what we're trying to do is provide you a state agency or for a nonprofit agency, their phone number and their website and direction on who has these resources that can help these families. So we want to teach you a little bit about making referrals. So you folks, you've been making referrals forever. I know that you're experts at what you're doing, but what we want to do is try to teach you a couple of referrals that we're thinking that you might not have in your toolbox already. So these, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six that are listed here, these are agencies that are able to actually take action and help you. So we know if you make a referral to the weatherization program through the CAP agency, the community action program, that they can help you. We know that we have funds for lead hazard removal through the CAP agency. We know that the fire department, the local fire department, can enforce the fire standard and the carbon monoxide standard. We know the local health officer or the code official should be able to help with the moisture and mold. And we also know that the health officer and the code official should be able to help with pests in the home. So we're just trying to think about which, which one of these referrals can actually take action and do something versus those that can only educate. So we talked a little about our families who want to quit tobacco. I can help make a referral to the quit line but I can't really do much more than that. These families have to do it themselves. Injury prevention is very similar through the Dartmouth Injury Prevention Center and the Poison Control Center. They're all agencies that can provide education. So I know that you all received a copy of the eight-page Healthy Home Brochure. Um, and we just printed, I think, 5,000 of these. So if any of your agencies needs a big old stack of these, we have them. And we're getting ready to reprint it to a smaller, more condensed version this fall, winter. But for now, we have this eight-page brochure. And these are the topics that it covers. Um, and what we did, we designed it so there's three things in there. There's a little paragraph that talks about, for instance, asthma. Here's a, a, I'm just showing you what asthma looks like. A little paragraph with the, you're not going to make them experts on asthma, but what they need to know. The next section is a pop-out box with some current statistics about asthma here in the state of New Hampshire. We're just trying to, we think it might help put it in perspective for these families. And then the, the, the last part are the take away the bullet points. So if you're going to try to help your family learn anything for asthma, these are the eight things that we want you to help them with. We're not going to make you an asthma expert. We're not going to make them an asthma expert. But it's a little, these are like bullet points, takeaways. And so, and then the bottom is the phone number for the asthma control program. So a paragraph, a little bit of data, the bullet points, and the phone number. And it's on there for um, lead and drinking water, asthma, radon, CO, bed bugs, tobacco. And it's got about eight or nine different topics in here. The back page of the um, Healthy Home Brochure has all the agencies 
that can help these families. So it's very similar to the page four of the checkup form, but we designed this for you to leave with the family so they can do some of these phone calls themselves. And there's uh, phone numbers in there for lead, for fuel assistance and weatherization, for fire and carbon monoxide, safety, tobacco, bugs, all sorts of things. So we like to think this is a good, um, a good thing to leave with these families. And we're interested in your feedback as we redesign this brochure. I think right now eight pages is a, is a pretty hefty brochure. It has a lot of text. So we're very interested in your feedback on this, what, how you believe your families are receiving this. And I have a box full, too, if anybody needs any of them. So here, Sherry and I have just provided you a little bit larger view so you can see what a pop-out box looks like. So it has, you know, how to get in touch of community action, fuel, and weatherization, which you probably already know anyways. But So earlier we were talking about the healthy home um, partnerships throughout the state. So we have a little over a half dozen. In the North Country, I think, um, I didn't put Kay Kirkwood's name here, but I think Kay Kirkwood would be the person that you'd be contacting. Lakes Region is Susan Labrack at the Lakes Region Partnership for Healthy Families. Um, in Franklin, Bristol is Melissa Rizzo at the hospital. Greater Manchester is Erin Kritsky at the health department. Amy Mountain is in Nashua. She works part-time for the health department and part-time for the city. Um, Stratford County, Kay Kirkwood's partnering with Tori Jennison. And Sullivan County, it's Jessica Rosman. Some of these um, are much more stronger and meet much more frequently than others. An example would be the Manchester and the Nashua. They meet monthly. Lakes Region meets fairly frequently, probably monthly or every other. North Country might not have met in six months. So if you have any interest at all in learning more about these partnerships, we need you. We want you. So the last thing that Sherry and I want to talk about here is making a referral. So we kind of we went back to the one touch checkup form again. So if you've gone through this checkup form, you've talked to your family, and now you want to make a referral to another agency. Well, you can't just go share their information without their permission because there is a private health information on here. So we you need their permission to share their private health information with another agency. So. Um, I, Jane Doe, Jane Doe would be the head of household, give permission to, and the administering program, that's the name of your program. So for Sherry, it's Child and Family Services. For me, it's the Division of Public Health, Childhood Lead Poisoning Program. And then here where the bullets are, you're listing the agencies that you're going to release the information to. So if the family needs help with asthma, you're going to make a referral to the Division of Public Health Services Asthma Control Program, you'd list that. If you're going to make a, um, a referral to the Weatherization Program, then you would list the name of the Community Action Program in your, uh, in your area. If you were going to make a, you wanted to get them some lead money, you'd make a referral to whatever the lead program is that you're going to make a referral to. They need to sign it and date it. So you're just getting their permission to share the information that you've collected about their home and about their family. So you just fill in here, just fill in here the different agencies. So once you've um, completed the one-touch checkup form, you want to send it to Division of Health and Human Services, uh, the Healthy Homes and Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. You can mail it, you can fax it, you can send it electronically, you can bring it by in person. Um, Currently, all this information is hand-entered into the computer. Sherry and I tried to postpone this training for another month or so because we're going to go to an electronic system that we think is going to be a lot nicer for you folks. You'll be able to enter. Um, you can either take your laptop or your tablet right into the home and fill out these questionnaires, or you can go back to your office and fill it out on the computer, but it would be uploaded instantly to the Internet instead of uh, mailing it, faxing it, or sending it to the Healthy Homes and Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. When we transition to that program and we have the new checklist, I imagine, Sherry, that we'll get back online with these folks and yeah, do another, do another training. training. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's so and, much easier. And for, and for my staff, um, you guys just keep giving the forms to me. Perfect. 
So here's the name of the Healthy Homes Environment section where you're going to mail them into. There's, you can mail it or you can fax it or I think the next slide is, is my email address. You can send them in electronically, whatever is easiest for you. Most people fax them in. They fax them in on a weekly basis. So here's my information. I wonder, oh, that's my information. Sherry, I don't know what happened to yours. I'm sorry. I must not have grabbed the most recent um, <laughs> that's presentation okay. with the computer being down. So I was wondering if there was anything that we forgot to talk about or that maybe we weren't as clear as we needed to be. Any questions? I don't see any typed in yet. Hi. Um, there was one question about, Beverly mentioned the name of someone to um, where folks could get uh, access to fire evacuation plans, and uh, we're hoping Beverly could oh. mention that name again. Is I Mary McCaffrey? And I bet you her phone number is right on the back of this. So Mary McCaffrey works for the State Fire Marshal's office. And the State Fire Marshal's office is, the phone number is 223-4289, and it's Mary McCaffrey, M-A-C-C-A-F-F-R-I-E. It's a very simple one. It's a nice little handout. So are there any other questions? I know we rattled through it really fast. Um, I was telling Sherry that I hope all of you can make the our fourth annual Healthy Homes Conference on sep in September. I know that we're going to work to get you all on the guest list. Um, and it's a great opportunity. We have a speaker coming on hoarding again this year, and we've got uh, we're we're featuring Misled, which is a documentary film on childhood lead poisoning nationally. We've got some really good speakers. By the way, Bev, is the, um, is the invite for that available yet for those of us that might have wanted to uh, use some remaining money up by June 30th? Um, I have been on vacation this week, but I was under the impression that it went out this week. But if you haven't seen it... Hmm. Okay, would, would Jessica Morton be the one to have sent that? No, yes, she would absolutely know. Okay. I'll, I'll look into that. Thanks. Okay. Well, I guess, are there no questions then? I don't see any other questions. I can't hear Maria. Can you hear me now? Okay. I can yeah. hear you now. Yes. Um, I don't see any additional questions. Um, so I guess that um, is it. I just uh, want to share a couple of final notes with folks, um, which is just to share the um, to please answer the evaluation um, that you get. And um, just I also wanted to let people know about a past webinar that people are waiting for. That the domestic violence webinar that um, we've made a decision it's not going to be publicly available. But we do have a link available for home visitors to, to view it. So it basically by request, um, you can be sent the link, but it's not going to be one of the ones that li is listed on our website um, under on the past webinars page. Um, and I think that's it. I really want to thank uh, both Beverly and uh, Sherry for making themselves available today. And um, again, you're going to receive an evaluation once the webinar um, is closed. And I would really um, appreciate if folks would take a moment to send that out. And um, you'll be receiving a certificate for attending this webinar uh, within the next couple of days. Great. I want to thank you all again for being so flexible about last Friday and the computer being <laughs> down. Well, okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.